Thank you very much to both of you. Um, and thank you very much for inviting me to come and speak to you uh, today. It truly is an honor to be here. And uh, I also want to extend my congratulations to Mark. Uh, Mark Zilke, who, of course, as a historian, I've known his work for many years. And you have put together a fine body of work and legacy that will outlast us all. <laughs> so congratulations, well deserved honor. Um, what I've been asked to speak to you today, and I come here not only as a historian who does a lot of work in the archives, but I do a lot of work on television and I also teach. I've been very fortunate to be able to teach at the university level, the college level, and the high school level. And so I have a rather unique experience bundling them all together. And I guess that's really what I want to talk about today in the context of storytelling and how do we actually broach that or breach, or excuse me, broach the gap between what we consider to be popular history and the academic world. And of course, like Mark brought up earlier, um, when I went to grad school, the name Pierre Burton was not something we heard a lot, at least in a positive way. And for years, um, I was actually shocked by that. And I guess for me, when I went along, it was trying to devise a way, when I started working in television many years ago with History Television, that was the challenge. The challenge was to come down out of the ivory tower and make what we were doing accessible. But as Daniel said, not to dumb it down. And so for years, again, like Mark said before, you bump your head. You continue to develop this craft as we go. And for me, it's a question, really, of the research. And although I know we want to wrap this up and I'm not going to take too long, I want you to consider the type of technology that we have available now to us as the historian and what we can do. When I started my book, or actually the research, what would lead to One Day in August, I started it in 1995, and I'll probably tell some tales out of school on this one. I was working as a young graduate student with the Director of National, or the Director of History and Heritage, part of National Defense, and I was doing my graduate studies at University of Ottawa. And they hired me to go over to England, basically bird dog. In other words, go over, find out what new releases were there, and photocopy them, and bring them back. So I was an extremely small cog in a very big machine. But the fascinating part in 1995 was that when I went over, not only did they have to fly me over, pay for my stay in one of the most expensive places on earth, but then the photocopies at the public record office used to cost a dollar a pop. Well, I came back with a bill for $28,000. Thank God I was working for the government. Hopefully the auditors aren't listening. This is 20 years ago. Now, um, for what I was eventually able to accomplish, if I tried to do this 20 years ago, it would have been prohibitive. There was no way that I would be able to pull that off. But fast forward over the 20 years, as declassifications of Dieppe and other matters came, we also had the advent of the internet, the digital age, which is absolutely remarkable. So now, for instance, when I was doing the last major push over the last five years for the book and for the television series, Dieppe Uncovered, I was able to access the catalogs of the files I needed. Before, they used to be almost like a library catalog. You'd have to go over there and go through them, photocopy them, work on them, and then order up your files. Now I can sit at home in Montreal. I can access the PRO website. I can figure out what you know files I'd like to get, assemble a hit list, and then email that to a researcher on site who then at a fraction of a cost will go in the next day or the same day with a digital camera, open up the files, and photograph every single page. Now, when I finished writing the book and I took a look at my archives, my digital archives, which are now on my computer, my laptop, I have 150 gigs of primary source material. 150,000 pages I went through for Dieppe. Now, that's unheard of. C.B. Stacy would be rolling in his grave right now. 
understanding what we can do as historians. And that's not just textual, or I should say, that's just textual documents. I can reach out on the internet, I can interview experts, I can find primary source humans, if you will, who are still around to tell their tale. As a matter of fact, in one of the most remarkable discoveries I made, I was trolling around on the internet looking for anything to do with the Royal Marine Commandos that landed at Dieppe on that particular day, which were central to the story I was telling. And I found a post, and this one must have been in 2012, I guess, and I found a post that had been put on in 2008 by the son-in-law of a former Royal Marine Commando who had passed away in 1995, or I should say wrote his memoirs in 1995, and kept them in a shed in the back for some apparent reason, and then died in about 2002. And when they were tearing down the shed, they discovered his memoirs. And he basically, you know, floated it out there. My, you know, my father-in-law was at Dieppe, he was with the Royal Marine Commandos. Does anybody know about that? Well, in 2008, I wasn't looking for it. In 2012, I did. And needless to say, this was central to the story I was looking for. So I got in touch with him immediately. And sure enough, he was able to photograph, PDF it, and send it to me. How amazing, when you think about it. And in there, not only, and if you know the story, if you've read the book, and I don't think I'm giving away the ending, but it turned out that as part of the pinch operation, he had been tasked with not only going into the Hotel Modern, but unloading the explosives out of his haversack, grabbing the material that was in the Hotel Modern, anything to do with the Fort Rotor Enigma, putting it in his pouch, and then jumping on a ship that was sent specifically into the harbor to take him out to meet Ian Fleming offshore, who was then to take it back. Now, all this came independently. It was written in 1995, and it was stored in a shed out back. Now, you couldn't have found that, or I never would have had access to that without the type of technology we have today. Not to mention the speed. And when you think about it, we can now go out, we can literally throw the net out wider than we ever had as historians. This is something that is really where we're moving to in history. And that's, I believe, how we start to broach this gap, or break through, solve the gap, if you will, and move to there. Because as we talked about before, who, what, when, and where is absolutely essential for the narrative. And the narrative is not going anywhere. It's the most powerful piece or tool for history that we have. But understanding why has always been the great, if you will, forgotten part of all this. And now, by able to, with us being able to stretch out over oceans, we are now starting to get to the answers to questions that we never even thought of asking, perhaps. To give you an example, sitting at home, of course, what I would do is I would send in my, my research list, my hit list, if you will. And the next day, I would get 1,500 to 2,500 pages. I haven't left my house. And then at my leisure, I can go through, I can cross-reference, I always have them there to go back to. And then guess what? When it came to Dieppe, knowing the impact and what Dieppe means to us, I could then spread the net wider and go down on various tangents to see if all the things we had learned before, the pillars of our historical understanding of Dieppe, really were solid or not. I could chase the myths, and then at the end of the day, decide whether those myths simply were that, or whether these priorities now in our understanding had to be reassigned. It also gave me the ability to take a look at the first document that I found, all about the raising of Ian Fleming's command unit, the one enticing document that I found in 1995, that to be honest with you, I almost dismissed immediately as nothing more than basically, you know, a caboose on a train or a passenger on a train. Because at that time, the information just wasn't there, and the ability to access it and cross-reference wasn't there. Now, by going through that process, I was able to put it to the test and attempt to debunk it. In other words, there's no way this could mean what it claims to say. Sure enough, that kept building. And to be honest with you, in this day and age, after going through 150,000 pages on the app, 
regardless of what the answer would be, whether it was Fleming or anything else, I'd be talking to you about that today. But I was allowed to do that because of the ability to harness this research. And at the end of the day, as wonderful as this story is, the storytelling is driven indeed by the research. Because we can expand, we can grab an incredible corpus of material, and as a result, the inferences that we draw from there are that much greater. So that's where we are starting to move. As a matter of fact, as I tell my, histor uh, my history students, I mean, I love research, and I'm sure Mark shares this, and anybody else who's ever been in an archive. For us history geeks, this is our Indiana Jones moment. <laughs> we love it, don't we? The smell of the paper, and understanding that every single page you turn can literally change history in front of us. Now, of course, I will temper the Indiana Jones thing by saying there are no snakes, no boulders, but in our line, plenty of Nazis. Um, but it, all said and done at the end, this is where we're moving to. Technology, the digital age, has hit us like a Mack truck, and it is wonderful. And I should conclude, and perhaps it's a bit trite, but I will say that the future of history is truly now, and it's time to embrace it. Thank you.